Let's now take a look at part numbering and pinouts of one of the more commonly used logic families to when you first start learning about digital logic circuits. So we kind of talked about, just to review, logic families, we talked about how in the beginning there was TTL, which stood for transistor to transistor logic, and then CMOS came along, which was a way to reduce the power consumption during steady state. And these these served as kind of uh, the logic families that are that were predominantly used in for digital logic. So since TTL was the first, uh, TTL, the first company that came out came out with this logic family was Texas Instruments, and so they were the first to create these these kind of broadly adopted logic or set of parts which were the logic families that everybody started using. So they kind of were the in charge or they got the, uh, the right to come up with numbering schemes. And the numbering schemes are actually still in use today. So it's good to take a look at the numbering scheme even if, you know, the parts are kind of, you know, using discrete parts uh, isn't, isn't really how you do large scale digital designs. Uh, it's good just to know the history of it because everything that you learn about the older parts still carries true to today. So all the DC specifications, AC specifications, it doesn't matter if you're using a part that's 20 years old or uh, just came out, they still have to adhere to the same specifications and still kind of follow a, a consistent number scheme. So let's take a look at, <coughs> uh, at, at numbering schemes. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at what we call the 7400 series. So the 7400 series were a set of discrete, we call them discrete parts. Uh, and the reason we call them discrete parts was they were individual parts which contained a set of logic or basic logic gates. So these are the ones where you might have a package that looks like a dual inline package that has a pin one indicator and you have one, two, down to seven. And these were kind of the first packages that came out <coughs> and very common, very commonly used uh, <coughs> in early computers. And they're still used today to learn about digital logic because they fit right nicely into a breadboard. And even though you might not use these, so one of these things might have a, an inverter on it, for example, or have multiple inverters on it. Even though you don't necessarily put these in a modern design because the packages are big and they don't have a lot of uh, functionality on them, you do use them to learn about digital logic <clears throat> and you do use them if you wanted to breadboard a simple circuit just to make sure that your logic is correct. So even though they might not make it into your final design, it's worthwhile to understanding uh, how they work and, and just the history of it all. So the 7400 series was a set of discrete parts and that is as opposed to an integrated circuit so an IC, and this is kind of one of these uh, nomenclature things, which is uh, not black or white. So an integrated circuit is where you have a single piece of material which contains everything that you need in order to implement a circuit. So integrated circuit, everything's integrated. So with on a, with on a uh, piece of, or a computer chip or a digital chip, this is a thin piece of silicon which has all the transistors uh, created on it. And on here you're gonna have conductors, you're going to have insulators, you're going to have transistors, you're going to have uh, resistors, capacitors, maybe even inductors, <clears throat> but everything that you need is on here. And these integrated circuit can contain, you know, today's integrated circuits contain millions and millions of transistors, large digital systems. Uh, discrete parts are where you say, okay, within this part, it's just going to be an inverter or it's just going to be an AND gate. So it's just going to be a simple thing. Now, an integrated circuit is a piece of silicon which is then put into a package and then mounted to a printed circuit board. Uh, so where it's a little bit confusing is that these discrete parts, even though they just contain an inverter, for example, within this part is actually an integrated circuit. It still has a piece of silicon in here with everything needed to, to create an inverter. So it's, we call this a discrete part just because it contains one device or multiple of the same device, but it really does is based upon an integrated circuit. Okay, so let's first start by looking at the part numbering scheme for the 74H series. So when you look at like a data sheet, what you'll start seeing here is <clears throat> one of the first things that they list, the, here's a t typical part number, and the first numbers you see on there are gonna be the manufacturer code. So SN was Texas Instruments. Uh, not sure whether they didn't use TI, but they were the first ones. They got to choose their name, so they chose SN. 
And then you had all these different companies that came along after that said, I'm also going to make discrete parts that work with your your logic, your 7400 series. <clears throat> so then they wanted a way to didn't know which manufacturer was which. So National Semiconductor, Fairchild came along, Toshiba. It then kind of became convoluted because people started using the same code. So like Fairchild used the same code as National. Then there was companies that came and went out of business. And so the manufacturer code is still still there and it's still used, but it, it isn't as meaningful today as it was when these first came out. But the 74 is a big one because the 74 dictates whether this part is going to be a commercial part or a military part. Okay, Same functionality, it's just the military part has a wider temperature range and so you're going to pay a little bit more money for it. But that's what the 74 means. So it's a 7400 series, but within that series is going to be a 54 equivalent part and that just has a wider temperature range. Then you get to the logic family code. <coughs> and this one, I have an example of HC. But the logic family, this is where you start seeing all the abbreviations. Now, there are tons of these logic families. They're, they've been going since the 60s. So there's, <coughs> these, there's just tons of these things. And if you look at it, the first one was TTL. And it didn't have this code because it didn't need a code. It was, I'm TTL, I'm the only one around. So if you ever see a 74 and then and this code is excluded and then it just has numbers, that was the original. Now there's not a lot of, I don't know if there's any of those parts still around today, but that was the original TTL. <clears throat> and that dictated all sorts of things. When you had a logic family, it dictated what the possible power supplies would be, what, what the pinouts were, all sorts of stuff like that. Then the TTL kind of evolved and you started having, you know, an L logic family, so low power, TTL low power. Then H was TTL high speed and then low power shot D and then, then CMOS came along and CMOS started with just C and then it started with HC for high speed and then HCT high speed but TTL compatible and advanced and advanced high speed. And they just go on and on and on, okay? So the logic family code here tells you basically the type of transistor that's going to be used, the size, you know, the for a given logic family, it's going to be typically a particular size of transistor. It's going to be certain power supplies and everything like that. So this is where the logic family kind of comes into into play here. Then you finally get to the part code. So you have zero zero is you know whatever zero zero was the NAND gate, and then. You know, 04 was an inverter, you had AND gates, OR gates, and AND gates. Now, remember that CMOS, you can't create an AND gate directly, or you can't create an OR gate directly. So what's in here is actually, when you get an AND gate, they simply took a NAND gate and put an inverter on the output to give you what you needed. So there's just tons of these logic functions that you are implemented in this. And then finally, you get to the package. So you have all sorts of package codes which are which tells you, you know, what kind of package this thing's going to be in. So this was, you know, this was one of the first part numbering schemes which was created for digital circuits. And it's still in use today. I mean, you can go out to DigiKey and you can purchase parts and you look them up by this part numbering scheme. So it's kind of good to know where it came from. And it, the reason it's good to know where it came from, even if you don't use one of these parts in your design, it shows you kind of the, the approach that people use in a part numbering scheme so that uh, you can understand if you use a different type of you know, digital basic gate technology, you kind of understand what goes into a part numbering scheme. Okay, so another thing, just while we're looking at, uh, well actually let me, sh let me show you this, this is kind of interesting. This is just a, a brief summary. It's a table that shows just roughly some differences uh, between the families. So the original TTL was 1964, Texas Instruments. Uh, then it was around for quite a while before they improved it. So that was uh, 1976 was when they started making the LS series. So it was around for 12 years before they came up with a major improvement. CMOS actually came up with the original C logic family. That was in the 60s too. That was kind of a 1968. But then the HC, which is kind of still used today is wasn't created in 82 and then AC advanced CMOS was 85 but so this is just an example of four of them but probably more interesting is the power supply ranges the original TTL ran off of plus five volts so the original logic was a zero was encoded as zero volts or ground and a one was encoded as plus five volts so that's how the first digital system started working and even back then I mean it was 
25 megahertz. So it could, these gates could actually toggle back and forth at 25 megahertz. And you can see that as they evolved, they got faster and faster and faster. That was accomplished by shrinking the transistors to creating, to making that gate delay go down. Uh, some other interesting things here. Uh, let's see, you can kind of see that the, the current, the ICC current, this, this basically QSN current, look at how much it has dropped. So in the beginning, this original TTL part, it was pulling 40 milliamps. I mean, that's a significant amount of current relative to the AC part, which is only pulling 80 microamps. So there's a huge amount of reduction in that QS and current, and that has a lot to do with the switch between TTL to CMOS. So you see that C TTL is, is it has this QS and current, or just the current it needs to hold a logic value is measured in milliamps, while CMOS is measured in microamps. So that was a that was kind of a big deal. Okay, so just to give you a, a feel for how many logic families there are, there are. So Texas Instruments was the first one. So here's here's just a, a view at their 2007 logic selection guide, and I like showing this because it just shows all of these logic families in one graphic that they've worked on over the years. So you see they they plot it by introduction, growth, maturity, decline, and obsolescence. So you have over here obsolescence. This is, this is 2007. And they show you the type of transistor. So you have bipolars in green, and then CMOS is in purple. It's a purple square. So most of these logic families use CMOS. They actually have a thing called bi-CMOS, which is it kind of takes the best of both worlds. So the, the drive strength of a TTL transistor and the low power consumption of CMOS, it converts them together. And then there's just straight bipolar. Notice what's, what's interesting, TTL is not in obsolescence, it's still in decline. So you probably could order one of these. <clears throat> uh, so anyway, you look at how many logic families there are. Just over the, the years, everybody's needed to tweak it. Transistors get smaller, they consume less power. So every time they do that, it's, they become incompatible with the prior logic family. And you want to you create a new logic family. So you have to create a new code. You have to create a whole new set of data sheets, specifications for that logic family. And then you push it out as a product line and people start using it and building large digital systems. So there's just a huge history of how these things have evolved to what we have today. Okay, so while we're talking about the 74 series, it's always interesting to look at the dual inline package uh, pinouts. So here's just a subset of kind of the most common, the most common gates that you're going to have. So for example, here is a, an inverter. So this right here would be an inverter. I'll turn it like this. So here would be your package, your pin one indicator. And you can see that they came up with the 74HCO4. So that means 74 is commercial, HC means CMOS, 04 is, it's an inverter. And notice there's six inverters on there. <clears throat> then you have the 74HC32. It's got four two input OR gates. And there's all sorts of gates in here. So this is, this is kind of how these gates are. And you, these are all in the logic family. So what's great about it is that you just select the logic family to meet your needs based upon the delay and the power and the power supplies you want. And then you go look at the parts that you have and you grab this part set and then you can start implementing your digital logic systems. So that's a, just a quick overview of the 7400 uh, logic series. And again, it's just to give a historical perspective in terms of where the terminology came from, uh, where, where you know, how the part numbering schemes came together, the pinouts that were defined that everybody has followed since, and just to give a, a historical perspective of where we are today.